My name is Matthias Schmidt. I'm uh, president and CEO of JCR USA, which is a subsidiary of JCR Pharmaceuticals. Both MPS1 and MPS2 are two diseases that belong to the disease arena of so-called lysosomal storage diseases. They're both classified by the deposition of certain substrates, um, heparin sulfate and dermatin sulfate, in all types of organs of the body, of the human body. And um, what finally happens if there is too much substrate accumulation, a pathology, a disease pathology develops. And we see this, um, the uh, kids that are affected by the disease, they show growth retardation, they show developmental delays, they show hepatosplenomegaly, um, they have other organ dysfunctions like pulmonary um, dysfunction, they have issues with their heart, and most importantly, um, they have developmental delays. So at the age of uh, one to one and a half years, there's first signs that something is not going well with the development of those children. They start missing certain milestones. And this is when usually the parents get a little bit suspicious. And then the diagnostic odyssey starts until they usually by a genetic test get diagnosed. Um, and are shown to have a um, deficiency or variant in uh, certain enzymes. In MPS1 and MPS2 it's different enzymes and um, causing the uh, disease pathology. This is usually when they start enzyme replacement therapy um, to help with the uh, clearance of the substrates in the somatic tissues and organs. And since the advent of the uh, enzyme replacement therapy for those diseases. Uh, they have really revolutionized the way how we treat those diseases. It's really giving back years to the life of those individuals, but very often giving back life to the years of those individuals is something that we have to still work on. It is very often the uh, cognitive disease burden, they have cognitive um, signs and symptoms, um, they have behavioral, neurobehavioral signs and symptoms, they have speech delay, uh, which really holds them back. And enzyme replacement therapy, unfortunately, does not cross the blood-brain barrier. Our news for MPS1 is that we also started a phase 1-2 study for the treatment of MPS1. It is a highly heterogeneous lysosomal storage disease and in our trial we actually uh, enrolled individuals with all forms of MPS1 from the very mild phenotype to a uh, very severe phenotype including some transplanted patients. What did we investigate in this study? The very first thing that you want to investigate is a biomarker and we looked at the uh, reduction of the substrates in the urine, in the plasma, and also in the cerebrospinal fluid. So we saw a, a very nice reduction of the substrate in, this, in the urine and the serum, and this is important to demonstrate somatic efficacy, and this is what is expected. And the reduction of the substrate in the cerebrospinal fluid may be an indicator of the reduction of the substrate in the brain which is very much the underlying hypothesis that these fusion molecules also reduce the substrate in the brain. And all the data that we have seen is they, they go very well into the direction that we were hoping to see. We see a reduction of the substrate in all um, fluids that we have tested. And as a uh, more clinical outcome, what we have measured is the next thing that you want to look at is organomegaly what is the development of the liver and the spleen size. You want in patients well controlled, you want to remain, you want to keep them, rem keep them in the range of a well controlled organ, organ size. And in naive patients you want to see a reduction. And this is exactly what we have seen. And then it comes to the uh, neurological disease burden. And here we have different assessment tools. For the, more, for the younger patients 
and the more severely affected patients, we are employing a, a tool called the Bailey Scale. It was originally developed for the assessment of the development of young children until the age of approximately 40 months. And that is an appropriate tool to uh, evaluate either the young or the severely affected individuals. For the older and less severely affected individuals, we use the tool, the so-called Kaufmann test. And depending on whether they were severely affected or attenuated, we have seen a uh, positive trend in all these assessments that demonstrate in severe patients, we either have a disease stabilization or a slight improvement. And in the attenuated patients, we see an improvement in all the domains um, that we have investigated. Of course, always with a disclaimer, it's a relatively small patient population and it's a relatively short duration of time. But it keeps us confident that this is a molecule where we believe it may be a treatment option for all forms of MPS1, including and most importantly, those ones after transplantation who currently don't have any, um, any other treatment option and also for severe untransplanted individuals or individuals who don't have access, who are ineligible for transplantation that JR 171 may provide disease amelioration or stabilization of the disease. And we recently published the 52 weeks data um, uh, in this study with this molecule. It's an open label study. Unfortunately, at this time, we don't enroll any more patients in the ongoing clinical trial. But we were very pleased with the data that we have seen after 52 weeks. So we have seen a safety profile for JR171 that is very well com compatible with the long-term treatment of individuals with MPS1. That is something that um, was very gratifying to see. What we also have seen is that the molecule provides somatic disease control relative to laronidase, which is the approved enzyme replacement therapy, somatic enzyme replacement therapy for MPS1. But also, despite a relatively small patient number and despite a relative, relatively short treatment period 52 weeks for these individuals, we believe we see very good signals that this molecule might have also an influence on the neurological disease burden in these individuals. So we have a platform technology that was developed to actually transport those molecules, enzyme replacement therapy, also across the blood-brain barrier to treat the brain and to treat the body. And thankfully, the first of these molecules that was based on this platform technology got approved for the treatment of MPS2 in Japan in 2021. And we have already very good longer term data how this new, the next generation of enzyme replacement therapy kind of helps change the daily life and helps fulfill some of the hopes and dreams of the individuals being treated with those enzyme replacement therapies. We as a company, as JCR, we don't want to bring this innovation only to patients in Japan. We want to bring this innovation you know, to children worldwide. And this is why we have started a global pivotal study with our first approved molecule, JR141 or Pabinafusp alpha. Um, we started a global phase three trial and countries enrolled are in Latin America, the United States, Europe, and um, we are going into additional countries. Our study is enrolling as we speak. We have two arms that we enroll. The first arm is children between two and a half and six years with a so-called neuronopathic phenotype of MPS2. And here we want to primarily demonstrate a benefit of Pabinafusp alpha over the standard of care 
which is idosulfase. And then we have a second arm where we are enrolling attenuated individuals um, with the age of six years and older. And here it's primarily to demonstrate that we also have a very good somatic disease control. Now this is for MPS2, the great news for MPS2. So in our pivotal study, we have a uh, dual primary endpoint. The first endpoint, the first primary endpoint, the co-primary endpoint, is a reduction of the substrate in the cerebrospinal fluid. And we are very confident that we can reach this endpoint. We have seen this from prior studies in Japan and in Brazil and other long-term studies where we follow up patients. The second endpoint is to understand whether we have an influence, a beneficial effect of JR141 or Pabinafusb alpha on the central nervous disease burden. And one of the key assays here is also the Bailey scale, which we apply for the severely affected patients in cohort A, where we want, want to demonstrate a benefit of idosol phase. This is a phase three study, so unfortunately I cannot tell any uh, interim data or anything that we see. Um, it is a phase three where we um, have limited ability to look into the data. And in the uh, attenuated cohort, um, we didn't define a primary endpoint, but we have a multitude of somatic endpoints to understand how well are those individuals doing on Pabina Fusb Alpha to address their somatic disease burden. And one of the key tests here is the ability how far a uh, individual can walk within six minutes under the standard of care or under the uh, treatment with Pabina Fusb Alpha. It sounds a little bit outdated, but it is generally a relatively um, suitable tool to see the um, holistic effect of the treatment um, on uh, many forms, on the muscular function, of the, on the skeletal function, on the overall function of the individual. So it is a, an assessment tool that is very much liked by the regulatory authorities. We include, um, of course, also cognitive um, tests in the attenuated patients. They have different cognitive signs and symptoms which often relate to attention deficiency, deficiencies in executive function, sometimes some neurobehavioral um, abnormalities. And we are using other tests like the TOVA test, tables of variables, variables in attention to demonstrate a potentially beneficial effect of Pabinafus alpha on the neurological disease burden also in attenuated patients. If you want to find more information, please have a look at clinicaltrials.gov. If you have patients um, who you might want to refer to those, any of those clinical studies, you will find um, on clinicaltrials.gov which centers are open, who are the investigators, um, how to refer them to the center. For our ongoing MPS2 study, we also have a beautiful website, starlightstudy.com. I invite you to have a look at this study. Also might be of interest, we don't stop with our platform technology in MPS1 and MPS2. What I'm very excited about, uh, we just uh, three months ago, we opened a study in uh, Europe uh, with, a, uh, with a similar uh, platform technology for the treatment of MPS3A. MPS3A is also a um, lysosomal storage disease primarily driven by the CNS disease burden. And the study has already received a lot of uh, attention in the patient community because currently there is extremely little opportunities for a interventional clinical trial. There is no approved standard of care for the treatment of San Filippo A, San Filippo B, C or D. And our plans are also to open a clinical study in San Filippo B or MPS3B within the year 2024. And I hope that everything will stay on track. And importantly, 
JCR has a mission to leave nobody behind and there's also a um, very strong commitment from JCR side to enter into ultra rare diseases and here we have a, a partner Medipal who is the biggest pharmaceuticals wholesaler in Japan who partnered several programs with JCR to bring this innovation also to patients who suffer from ultra-rare diseases. We're talking here about fucosidosis, uh, galactosialidosis, or CLN1, um, as diseases where we are talking about hundreds of patients worldwide and not thousands of patients worldwide. It will still take a little bit um, of time until we will be able to enter clinical studies. These molecules, they are not very easy to manufacture, but our commitment to also help the ultra-rare disease community is out there.